Uh, hi, Bella. Um, yeah, this business of guilt as a negative value state that may be necessary in certain cases, or in a lot of cases, I guess. Um, yeah, I, I understand how we grow as individuals. Sometimes there are those who believe the majority of times we learn more from getting a kick in the teeth than we do from, uh, you know, a big uh, plate of strawberries and cream or whatever. Uh, oftentimes it's a blow, it's a, a, a traumatic experience, I suppose, or not even, not necessarily a traumatic experience because, well, <laughs> what doesn't make me stronger kills me, right? <laughs> um, it, the, uh, the, the value, the utility, I guess, or perhaps not value, but the utility of negative value states is, well, it seems to be undeniable. Uh, but again, it depends on how much negativity is in that state. If you reduce to a state of despair, um, utter discouragement with everything, then no, I don't really think that a negative value state at that point has reached, or has remained within the bounds, rather, of useful. Um, again, uh, Anything, too much of anything is not a good thing, because by the very fact that it's excessive means that you've exceeded the boundaries of that which is useful to you. Um, so, <clears throat> I understand the necessity of suffering, of negative value states in certain cases, if we need to grow as people. But... Um, when you read life in that way, if you take a big picture view of existence itself as a never-ending process of growing, after a while you start to feel, or it starts to evoke an image of a treadmill that just goes on. <laughs> you know, presumably if you're growing, you're growing towards something, some sort of culmination. There's some sort of goal, I guess, at the end. Um, although that's kind of a, a wimp of a word, a goal. Um, I would say it's a culmination. Um, it's, uh, it's important, I think, for, for one to sort of at least in moments of sort of, I don't know, a, a sense of clarity to sort of say, okay, I'm going somewhere with this, right? All this growing as a person, you know, all these blows that I've taken, all these kicks in the teeth have some utility because I'm heading somewhere with this. Um, so yes, I, I can relate to uh, the idea that guilt is a necessary thing to grow as a person. I did something that I didn't understand in advance that I was going to regret, or I didn't understand that my doing this action was going to result in a negative value state, and a negative value state is, if we have the ability to influence our own value states, then a negative value state is an error, right? So guilt it becomes an error. So I had to feel the negative, the negativity of guilt in order to have my attention drawn to the fact that I had made an error. Okay. So it was, you know, in hindsight, it was a necessary thing or a useful thing for me. <clears throat> but guilt should never become excessive. And that's the problem with guilt. You can never really make sure that the punishment fits the crime because guilt is kind of one of those open-ended things. You seem to be able to just keep feeling more of it. <laughs> um, your pain receptors in your body eventually shut down, but your guilt receptors don't seem to have that uh, that natural failsafe. Uh, it just keeps piling on. Um, now, um, what I would do in that case, though, is I would sort of also reverse the roles here. Let's say I'm thinking, okay, this guilt is necessary to sort of prevent me from uh, committing errors, okay? To prevent me from putting myself in negative value states. 
reverse that and say that you're talking to the second person singular um, or third person singular or plural. In other words, you or they <laughs> or, you know, them, that kind of thing. He. He needs to feel guilty because what he has done is bad. When I do that, I'm playing God. <laughs> I'm saying that what this person did was bad. And I can tell. I'm, I've become the arbiter here of good and evil. I can say that what this person did was bad bad, and I must draw their attention to it, even if I have to invoke a negative value state in them. I don't see that as any other act than that of playing God. I can tell what's good and bad. And I am deciding who has done good and bad. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of a kind of a tough love that's gone kind of sick. Um, I have taken it upon myself to judge this person, in other words this other person has made an error and I'm going to teach that person not to make that error um, because what they have done is fundamentally bad because this is kind of the the thinking that informs the process of guilt guilt inside oneself um, <clears throat> I have done something which is bad or which is resulted in a negative value state in myself uh, therefore, I need a negative value state to bring my attention to the fact that negative value states result from certain thoughts or actions or whatever. Okay, now I have to do that to the other person. I have to invoke negative value states. But it's for their own good. It's, um, it, I'm making this other person suffer because they can't see what is absolutely true. Because I can see what this person did has resulted in bad. That is scapegoating. <laughs> we know where scapegoating goes, don't we? Um, when I say that other person's actions are precisely and exactly what caused a bad outcome, I'm basically saying it's his or her fault, or maybe it's your fault. Um, you're to blame. It's you who did this. Um, <clears throat> now, I understand, again, the necessity of acts of coercion sometimes in society, but we have to understand that there's several reasons why we might have these things. Again, do we have prisons as a means of correcting people? Do we have prisons as simply a garbage dump to put human garbage into them to keep them sort of quarantined from everyone else? There's, you know, as a society we seem conflicted. Um, or are these things there as sort of exemplary places of suffering, where you throw people in there, all kinds of horrible things happen to them in there, plus they're, uh, they're confined and they can't get out and they miss out on all the good things in the outside world. So everyone else looks and says, oh, I don't want to end up in there. So anyway, we, we don't really, we haven't kind of made up our mind what function these things called prisons serve. Um, but if we want to sort of say, look, that's where we put people who have consistently shown that their actions result in evil. What we've essentially done is we've said, okay, we're going to take the people who are to blame for all the bad things in this world, 
and put them in there. Does that kind of sound familiar? I thought that was a lesson that we sort of learned the hard way in the last, I don't know, 100 years or so. <clears throat> Scapegoating. Um, are there people who are just plain disruptive? Just, you know, it's not that this person has done something disruptive, it's that this person is disruptive. Uh, because that's kind of, when you think about the logic of guilt, that's essentially what, um, where it leads. You sort of say, okay, you have done something bad, your actions, not my actions, your actions, have resulted in a bad outcome. <clears throat> Therefore, <coughs> excuse me, Therefore, you have made an error here. You have placed others, or yourself perhaps, or both, in a negative value state. That's not just judging someone's actions. That's not just sort of looking in the rule book and saying, okay, you did this, therefore your penalty is this. Sort of like Sharia, you know, it's just, this is what you do. This is, you know, you've stolen, therefore we cut your hand off or whatever. Okay, it's just open and shut case. Um, rather than that, we are sort of judging you as a person. Um, it's not just that there's, there's a transgression and then there's payment and we will assume that the situation has been restored to what it was before the crime took place. We're actually saying you yourself are the problem. Um, it's not what you did, it's you. Um, and that's what you do when you, when you sort of say that you have brought about negative value states. When you sort of, when you take the guilt that, that sort of seems to sort of spring spontaneously inside oneself and you impose it upon someone else or you superimpose it or you project it or whatever you want, the results are ugly. Um, I can't see the results as anything other than scapegoating. And for a good illustration of that, um, if you've ever been consumed by excessive guilt, in a moment where you're consumed by excessive guilt, and say you have all these, I don't know, fantasies of being berated or whatever it is that, that you know, whatever your, your sort of purging is in terms of your own guilt. A lot of people sort of have uh, uh, thoughts of being punished and everything. Okay, let's say that you imagine yourself being severely punished in some way as some means of working out the guilt that's on you. Well, reverse the positions. You're doing that to somebody else. You're not self-flagellating. You're flagellating someone else. Extremely ugly, isn't it? <laughs> um, if you're not, or if you think that, if you, if you understand that this kind of guilt applied to oneself is horrific, why on earth would you want to impose that on someone else? But again, the thinking of guilt is, I'm guilty. Um, therefore, I'm correct in wanting this sort of purgative of my state. Okay. Therefore, when you sort of look into the mirror image of that, where I'm looking at somebody else, and I say, my judgment of that person is correct, therefore I will put them through some sort of purgative, you've got scapegoating. Guilt and scapegoating are, in my opinion, virtually synonymous. It's just certain types of guilt are internal, where you scapegoat yourself, and the external projection type guilt is when you scapegoat others. Now, it's not just enough to sort of say, yeah, that's horrifying. I think that we have to look into that. Why is scapegoating so horrible? 